Now we're going to go on and work on the bottom stereo center. Well, the first thing we should do is erase all the work that we did on the top stereo center. And I strongly encourage you to do this on your own when you're doing these problems on your own as well. If there's more than one stereo center, after you've worked out one stereo center, erase the work that you just used before you go on to the next stereo center. Otherwise, the page is going to get very messy and confusing. Now I've erased the asterisk at the top stereo center and I've drawn in an asterisk at the bottom stereo center to remind myself that now I'm focusing on this bottom stereo center. We're done with the top stereo center. Let's put dots in for the four atoms that are directly connected to the bottom stereo center. Don't forget to put a dot up here because this atom is also directly connected to this stereo center. Well, this fluorine gets the top priority. The hydrogen gets the number four priority. Let me point out a mistake that would be easy to make. It would be easy to assume that this group gets the highest priority because it has this iodine over here. You might say, oh, iodine beats fluorine. But notice that this iodine hasn't even had a chance to come into play yet. We're just comparing the atoms with the dots that are directly connected to the stereocenter. Well, when we compare the atoms that are directly connected to the stereocenter, this fluorine on the left beats the carbon on the right. And this group never gets a chance to bring the iodine into play. At least it doesn't get a chance to bring that in when we're comparing to the number one priority on the left over here. So this is number one. Uh, here's number four. Now there's a tie between this carbon and this carbon. Again, remember that this intersect intersection is a carbon. So we have to make a list of the three atoms that those two dotted carbons are attached to. This carbon is attached to an iodine and two hydrogens. Now the iodine comes into play, but it only comes into play when we're comparing these two groups. And what are the three atoms that this carbon is attached to? Well, it's attached to this bromine, this carbon, and this hydrogen. This dotted atom is attached to a bromine, a carbon, and a hydrogen. Bromine, carbon, hydrogen. And we have to write those from best to worst. The first point of difference here is at the first atom in the list. This iodine beats this bromine. So this gets the number two priority, and on top we get the lower number three priority. Remember to stop when you get to the first point of difference. The first point of difference here is at the first atom in the list. This iodine beats this bromine. So this is two and this is three. It's totally irrelevant that the second atom here, carbon, beats the second atom over here. It's true that this carbon is better than this hydrogen, but that's completely irrelevant because that's not the first point of difference in the lists. Once we got to the first point of difference, we ignored the rest of the list. So again, despite the fact that this carbon is better than this hydrogen, this is the group with the higher priority because at the first point of difference, the iodine beat the bromine. And that's the kind of issue that you're much less likely to get confused about if you actually physically write down the list of three atoms that the dotted atoms are connected to. Now we can erase our work for finding priorities. Now, where's the number four priority? The number four priority is on the vertical line. Now, the vertical line, we always interpret as pointing away from the stereo center. And that is not affected at all by the fact that there's two stereo centers here. Now that we're focusing on this carbon, um, we should interpret this vertical line as pointing away from the stereo center. And we should also interpret this vertical line as pointing away from the stereo center. The interpretation of the vertical lines is exactly the same when there's multiple stereo centers as when there's only one stereo center. When we focus on this stereo center, we can interpret both this line and this line as pointing away from this stereo center. Well, the number four then is pointing away from us, so there's no need to make any swap. We only make a swap when the number four is not pointing away from us. So we just look at the configuration on the page. One to two, two to three, 
to the three, back to one. That is counterclockwise, or S. And there's no need to cross this letter out. Since we didn't make any swaps, the first letter we write down is also the correct configuration. So this bottom stereo center has an S config configuration. Remember, we already decided that the top stereo center has an R configuration. So now we've determined again that the top stereo center had an R configuration and the bottom stereo center had an S configuration. I'd like to do one more thing for this molecule. Why don't we write out the full, complete IUPAC name for this molecule? Try pausing the video and see if you can write out the complete IUPAC name for this molecule. You got to start by finding the longest carbon chain and numbering it. So now I'm going to number the longest carbon chain. Here's the number one carbon. Here's the number two carbon, here's the number three carbon, and here's the number four carbon. That's the longest carbon chain. Now, here's a trap. I think a bunch of people might not have realized that this carbon can be part of the parent chain. You might have thought that the parent chain just had three carbons, but there's no law that says that the parent chain has to all be on the vertical. There's no rule that the parent chain has to be all on the vertical of the Fischer projection. It's perfectly okay for the parent chain to move horizontally into the Fischer projection. Um, so we have to... Um, get the longest possible string of carbons. Well, that happens when we include this carbon in that chain. And of course, we should start with this is the number one carbon and not with this is the number one carbon, uh, because when this is the number one carbon, um, we get a substituent on the number one carbon. But if we had named this the number one carbon, there wouldn't be a substituent until the number two carbon. You might remember from learning about nomenclature that you should try to number the, longest, the parent chain uh, to give the lowest possible number to a substituent. Um, and of course, remember that these numbers that I've put in here have nothing to do with the priority numbers for R and S. These are not the priority numbers for determining R or S. These are a completely different set of numbers. These are the numbers for uh, numbering the longest parent chain when we're doing the nomenclature of the molecule. That's completely separate from the priority numbers. So of course, at this point, you would want to definitely erase all the priority numbers before you start numbering the parent chain so that you don't get confused the way I've already erased the original priority numbers on the board. I've written the complete IUPAC name for this molecule here at the top of the board. So let's go through that and see if we can understand where this is coming from. Now remember that, of course, we have to include the R and S stereochemistry in this name. That's the whole reason why we bothered to figure out whether this was R or S, whether the stereocenters were R and S in the first place. We have to know whether they're R or S so we can give the complete, correct IUPAC name. Well, what we've discovered so far is that this number two carbon had an S stereochemistry, 2s, and then the number 3 carbon had an R configuration, so this is 3R. Earlier in the series of videos, we've done one other example of a complete IUPAC name, uh, but in that example, there was only one stereocenter. If there's only one stereocenter, you still need to say whether it's R or S, but you don't need to use a number to say where it is, because obviously if there's only one stereocenter, um, it's easy to say, it's easy to see where it is. But when there's two stereocenters, you need to number each stereocenter in the name so you know which one has the S and which one has the R. And even if these have the same configuration, you would still have to give them numbers according to the convention. So even if these were both S, you would still have to say 2S, 3S to say where they are. If there's more than one stereocenter, you have to use a number to say where the stereocenter is. Okay, and then the bromine is on the number three carbon, the fluorine is on the number two carbon, and the iodine is on the number one carbon. We have to list the uh, substituents in alphabetical order, 
B comes before F and F comes before I. There were four carbons total, so this is butane. Uh, I think that maybe the official method here is to put the stereochemistry in parentheses. Okay, well, usually in these videos, we're not going to take the time to actually write out the complete IUPAC name. We're just going to figure out whether the stereocenter is R or S. But it's important for you to realize that one of the main purposes for determining whether a stereocenter is R or S is so that you can write the complete IUPAC name if that's necessary. <coughs>